Hello and welcome back to another edition of GNAT TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director at GNAT TV's News Project, and it's a pleasure to have you with us today on Monday, February 14th. So, happy Valentine's Day to everyone out there as well. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to be joined by a very special guest uh, today. Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray is with us. Uh, as many of you know, she's uh, one of the candidates who's uh, running for the U.S. Congress seat in the Democratic primary that will be coming up in August. I guess that'll be the first stop. Uh, and uh, then on to the general election from there. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Gray, great to have you back on our program today. I uh, want to thank you for making the time for this conversation. Thank you for having me on, and happy Valentine's Day. All right. Uh, it seems like only a few only a few short weeks ago you were down here at uh, Burn Burton. We had a chance to talk then, and uh, uh, great to have a, a little more time today to kind of uh, sort of go into a little more depth, perhaps, into some of the issues that are going to be uh, central to your candidacy for uh, the congressional seat currently held by Peter Welsh. Uh, so why don't we start there, and, and let me just throw out that question kind of generally. What are what are a couple of the main issues you you feel uh, prompted you to run for the office and that you uh, are planning to to, uh, to talk about a lot as we go forward to at least the August primary? They are the issues that Vermonters are dealing with every day. They're the issues that I witnessed and heard Vermonters uh, talk about uh, day in and day out for the last year, but also for the last several years. And I think they're the issues that are impacting our state because of our demographic crisis, because we're a small rural state with an aging population. These issues are housing access, not only uh, housing for our older Vermonters who might want to move into uh, independent or supported living, but for our workforce, a workforce that wants to come to the state or stay in the state and enter so many of the good paying jobs that we have. So it's housing, it's our workforce crisis. And we know that in order to recruit and retain workers, we need housing. But at the same time, we have gaps in nearly every sector, from nursing to education, law enforcement, mental health and support service providers, plumbers, electricians, you name it, there's a job for you here in Vermont. But we haven't figured out yet how to crack the nut on uh, keeping people here. And I have a lot of ideas and proposals, but I think what I know is that our solution comes from strong federal partnership. Vermont can't go at it alone. And the same is true for childcare, where we have a childcare system that's really in crisis. We don't have enough childcare providers, but we also don't have a system that's truly affordable for working families. So for me, my focus in running, what gets me out of bed in the morning, what keeps me up at night, is the needs of Vermonters, and that's what I'll be laser focused on as Vermont's Lieutenant Governor. Workforce, housing, and child care, to name the top three. Okay, well, well let's start with the housing uh, issue then, because it certainly is one that's received a great deal of attention and, and certainly was an issue before the COVID pandemic arrived and, and kind of uh, exacerbated it all the more, it seems like. Uh, I guess I just find myself wondering, what what is the pathway to figuring out how do we get more housing, particularly in that sort of affordable slash workforce, uh, middle range housing sector that seems to be the problem where uh, a lot of companies or people I talk to in the business community seem to say, you know, we have a heck of a hard time recruiting people to come here because housing is just so expensive. They look at the numbers and they say, well, no, I don't think I can afford it. Um, what what is the way out of that? Uh, it, it, it clearly it involves some kind of uh, federal and state incentives of some sort or another. But uh, what do you what do you see as the as the the missing piece that we need to put in there? I don't think there's one single missing piece. It's a multi pronged approach, and uh, it's an approach that both addresses the affordability questions but also addresses just the lack of housing. I think a lot of Vermonters would agree that right now, it doesn't matter how much you're making, you just can't find housing. And we saw this when we tried to support housing and secure Vermonters in moving out of the hotel motel program into potential rentals, but the rentals didn't even exist. We've also seen this, as you said, where we have great employers in the state, be it Rutland Regional Medical Center or um, awesome businesses in, in Manchester, Bennington, Southern Vermont, where they've made offers to individuals outside of the state. And then those individuals have had to turn down the offer because they just couldn't find housing in the area. 
So where does the federal government come in? I think that's the big question, right? We have a lot of um, amazing housing agencies, advocates, um, developers in the state. I think the federal government comes in and one, helping us with that workforce, making sure that we can train and retrain electricians, plumbers, builders, the jobs that we need, uh, and workers that we need to build housing. The federal government comes in in supporting investments in water and sewer, because let's face it, if we don't have the water and sewer infrastructure, which a lot of funding will come to Vermont through the bipartisan infrastructure plan, if we don't have that water and sewer infrastructure, we won't be able to build. Um, it's also then making sure that housing is affordable. So supporting the you know, first time home buyers um, with tax credits or different incentives, uh, making sure that uh, we've got affordable housing across the state through uh, federal programs, uh, grants, so that we've got housing for workers, we've got housing for our older Vermonters, we have accessible housing. But we also need to look at the housing stock that we have and invest in weatherization, invest in making the housing uh, safe, um, making sure that if there are spaces that could be renovated. The Putnam Block is such an amazing example in Bennington where we can bring community partners together with federal funding to support renovation. So I know it's not the answer that folks generally like because we want a silver bullet, but there's no silver bullet for housing and it's gonna take a lot of different tools in the toolkit. It's gonna take a lot of partnership and a lot of um, Vermont ingenuity through strong federal partnership. And I, if elected, I can't wait to get to work to help solve this challenge for Vermont. And it's not solely a Vermont challenge. It's a challenge that rural states across this country are facing. So there's a lot of good ideas out there as well. And I think we can both be a laboratory, but learn from states that are doing things well. Mm, okay. Uh, and related to that, and, and you alluded to it uh, in your answer just then, uh, workforce development, I know, is uh, an issue that Governor Scott has been stressing. And, and I'm sure it's one uh, that if elected to Congress, you'd be dealing with in some way because, as you said, Vermont is not alone in, uh, in trying to rebuild its workforce or to uh, uh, attract more workers to the state uh, and, and fill certain job, uh, jobs that are, are going vacant. But what, uh, when we talk about workforce development, it seems like a lot of it seems to also uh, get, get back to the trades as well, like electricians, carpenters, plumbers, that, those sorts of jobs. Um, does the state need to do more in terms of uh, like secondary at the secondary level of education to encourage students who might be inclined in that direction, but right now aren't getting the kind of encouragement perhaps that they, they might need? Not only does the state, we as a state, I'll say this as a lieutenant governor, we need to do more, but we need to do more as a nation. And that's where Congress comes in. Housing isn't going to build itself. Broadband isn't going to deploy itself. Solar panels and meeting our climate goals won't happen on their own. We need the workforce to be able to really transform our future and build a 21st century resilient, climate resilient, pandemic resilient economy. So I think, and I'll be honest, when I grew up, there wasn't a lot of incentives to go into being a plumber or an electrician or a mechanic, nurse or, or an educator, I ended up being a lawyer. And my God, I have so much student loan debt I'm still trying to get rid of. Um, but as a society, we need to recognize that these are the jobs that keep our communities thriving, that keep them whole, that um, provide health care. As I said, these are the jobs that help us meet our climate goals. And so every, um, I guess, every support that we can give to a generation, to workers ready to enter these jobs, we need, we need to give that support. And what does that look like? It looks like supporting our career and technical education centers, uh, Riverbend Career and Technical Education Center, where I went to school, um, Oxbow High School in Newberry and Bradford, um, the CTEs in Randolph and Southern Vermont across the state. It means supporting our, our technical schools, you know, be it VTC or Castleton or state colleges where we have amazing criminal justice and nursing programs. Uh, making sure that they have the funding, but making sure that Vermonters can also go to community college. I strongly support the leadership of Senator Sanders and President Biden in making community college free. I, I think that's a direction that ultimately we need to go. And it starts with um, ensuring there's no barriers to accessing training or higher education, but also making sure that 
we have incentives in place here at home to say, if you come to Vermont and you decide to be a nurse or you decide to be an electrician, we're going to help you stay here. We're going to have the landing pad. We're going to have housing. We're going to have childcare. Um, hopefully we'll have broadband access and we may even support some of your uh, uh, process and getting settled, getting settled here. And so, I so I'm glad that we're finally having conversations about our workforce crisis. It's why I ran for lieutenant governor. It's something I'm deeply passionate about. Um, but I think that there's more we can do, and I look forward to uh, having this be a key focus if elected to Congress. Um, really keeping Vermonters and this workforce challenge at the forefront in my work every single day. So uh, I was wondering. Uh, I mean. This past session in Congress, one of the uh, one of the bills that didn't make it through all the way uh, to uh, President Biden's desk for a signature was the Build Back Better bill, uh, and ran into uh, a lot of issues around that. And I, and I guess as I understand it anyway, um, there may be an, a, an attempt uh, this year in Congress to try and revive parts of it instead of having one gigantic bill where the fixation becomes the price tag of $1.7 trillion, a number that's so huge that most people can barely wrap their heads around it. The idea might be to break it up into some component parts and pass them separately. Are there, are there some pieces of that Build Back Better package that you feel are really critical uh, that have to, when we get to the finish line, they have to be at least among those component parts that make it to the president's desk. Absolutely, paid family and medical leave. It's been heartbreaking to watch that piece of the Build Back Better agenda be a real thorn in the side of some senators, a, a real point of contention. Uh, and let me tell you why it's so important to Vermont. We are an aging state, one of the oldest states in the nation. We have a lot of folks who consider themselves the sandwich generation, where they're not only trying to take care of kids or thinking about starting a family, but at the same time trying to care for aging parents. And that's me. That's, you know, that's my own personal story. My mom was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when I was in middle school. And a couple of years ago, when I was working in the attorney general's office, she got quite sick and went into the hospital. And I found myself, I was working at night at the time to help pay off my student loans. And I used my vacation days and then my sick days and then my personal days, which wasn't a whole lot because I was accruing them to care for her. And I was going to have to take unpaid leave. And, and luckily she got better, but it really made me personally understand how deeply important it is to have that little bit of cushion when family members get sick or you need to take a little bit of leave to support loved ones. It's really important for Vermont because where we don't pay for paid family medical leave, we end up paying in unemployment when someone actually has to leave the workforce because there's no infrastructure in place. And in Vermont, we saw some of the highest percentage of unemployment claims filed by women in the nation um, in recent years during the pandemic. Vermont women in particular really step up to the plate and provide care uh, during tough times and ultimately face the largest economic challenges and burdens because of it. So for me, it's quite personal. Um, it's been hard to watch paid family and medical leave be such a contentious issue nationally. My feeling is how can we afford not to pass it? it it's going to keep people in the workforce. It's going to provide economic stability. Uh, I think it's crucial to a stronger recovery, not only for Vermont, for the nation. So I support it being pulled out, passed. Um, but if it doesn't get passed, Vermonters should feel uh, very confident and, and rest assured that if I get elected, I'll be working every day to help get paid family medical leave across the line for a state. There's another piece to that that I, I guess uh, you alluded to it there um, a moment ago, uh, college tuition uh, loan debt. Uh, as I understand it right now, college tuition loan debt, the, the interest uh, payments have been sort of put on hold. You can pay down your loan debt uh, and you're paying down principal. Uh, is that a program that should be continued uh, 
going forward? I mean, would you support the idea that uh, interest payments should be maybe just done away with uh, and students who took out loans to finish uh, undergraduate or graduate school um, should just pay down that principal? Student loan debt can be a crippling for many Vermonters and Americans. And I know folks who are still paying student loan debt, I was talking to the AARP, into the point where they're eligible for AARP and social security benefits. I mean, it's, there is a generation that uh, was led to believe that student loan debt was just a fact of life and that you would be able to pay it off. If you, got a, you would get a good job and you'd be able to pay it off. Well, it's just not, it's not true. Um, and there's a lot of students who are, are adults, working adults who are trying to pay a mortgage, trying to afford health care, trying to afford child care, and then still working each, each month to pay off the student loan debt. Um, but what we know from the pandemic is that those monthly payments were deferred or stopped and there was no interest that was uh, continuously accrued. That's certainly been helpful in my case. Um, and I think it's time that we have an honest question about what the economic impact of having um, thousands and thousands of Americans, including Vermonters, um, having that uh, economic instability caused by student loan debt and whether we as a nation have the obligation to cancel some of it or to, um, in some instances, stop these interest payments. It's seven, I think in some cases, mine may be 7.5% compounding interest. That's a lot. So it's an important conversation. It's one that I welcome. Uh, and I think that it's, it's critical to a stronger recovery and making sure that we're giving a generation that bought into an education system the tools to really succeed and to be able to eventually retire with dignity and financial security. Yeah, because I, I mean, as, as I'm sure you well know, the fact that uh, individuals have such massive monthly payments that keeps them from buying homes, from buying furniture, from buying cars. Um, but I, I, I had a conversation the other day with someone on the subject and, and who pointed out that, well, yeah, but for a long time now, people, people have been paying off that interest. I mean, does that mean that they're, that all that money that they spent on interest payments in the past is like, was like wasted or they, they should have just waited. And I, I guess I just wonder if it's possible to retrofit that into the, into the equation at this point. I think we have to have a lot of discussion about how we can ensure that those individuals who have I mean, student loan debt that just doesn't allow them to live in Vermont and stay in Vermont and work in Vermont. And I think there's a lot of different options. Part of it's canceling, uh, part of it's looking at the, um, the, the payments on the interest, uh, but it's a conversation we need to have. It's a conversation I'm certainly prepared to have. And, um, and as I said, it doesn't just impact the I'll tell you how old of a 37 year old impacts our 40 year olds and 50 year olds. And even those who are trying to prepare for re retirement, but may not have any retirement because they've been paying student loan debt. So it impacts all of us at the end of the day. Um, you know, one of the other, uh, well, uh, two, two related questions, I guess. Um, I was just curious. I mean, one of the, the themes as I've tried to follow things in Congress this past eight or nine months or so has been that uh, there are factions within the Democratic Party in Congress, progressive wing and what might be called a mainstream wing that seem to have had a hard time communicating well with each other. I guess, what, what is your sense of that? Do you feel like uh, if you're elected, uh, you, you would feel it's really important to kind of help uh, bring those factions together, if that's the right term to use? But it just seems like sometimes a lot of the messaging uh, that, are, that the, the Democratic Party in particular seemed to have tried to get out about what they wanted to do to enact President Biden's uh, agenda, if we can use that term, seems to have gotten lost in a conflict between progressives and, and more mainstream centrist Democrats because there either was a question of the cost or do we really need to do this or folks back home really don't want this. I mean, I, what is your feeling about that? Do you feel like uh, there's a conversation that could eventually bring those two, two parties together? Congress needs to deliver for the American people and put the bickering aside, to be really blunt about it. I, 
I've always believed and am regularly reminded by my older brother, uh, listen twice and speak once. And I think that's an important thing in life that we uh, come to the table ready to listen, try to understand the perspectives and lived experience and points of view of either those within the Democratic Party or those within the Republican Party um, or the Progressive Party. We just, we, we come together and begin there in that space. But I'll share, I, I believe that uh, workforce, housing, childcare, equitable access to broadband, affordable health care, action on climate, those aren't Republican, Democrat, or progressive issues. Those are issues that are impacting every single American business owner, even the Joint Chiefs, right? The DOD is worried about climate change. And so I think the focus has to be less about rhetoric and more about what steps are we going to take collectively right now, each day, to address them. And sometimes they might, some days it might be small steps and some days it might be big steps, but at, so long as we're taking steps forward and that might mean compromise. And I think that's okay. Uh, you know, I support, I support um, meaningful legislation, but making sure that we're still moving forward. And right now we just don't see that. Although if I may, one thing that I think is quite positive, and we've seen this in the last couple of weeks is a bipartisan effort to address uh, integrity and public trust in government. Uh, I do not support members of Congress owning and trading stocks. I don't think that's um, what members of Congress were sent to Congress to do. That they shouldn't be sitting in committee hearings and or in, in confidential or private briefings getting special information on the pandemic or economic downturn and be thinking about what is this gonna mean for my, for my stocks? They've gotta be worried about um, problem solving and delivering for the American people and delivering for Vermonters. So it's been concerning to learn, but I'm hopeful that Republicans and Democrats are finding space right now and, re and returning to figuring out how to work together. And we're seeing um, some important legislation come to bear that will uh, stop this practice and I think hold uh, some members of Congress accountable. And that's really important. I support it. Uh, another potentially bipartisan initiative underway in Congress uh, seems to be around this Electoral Count Act that's been proposed by, I think, uh, uh, Republican Senator Josh Hawley from Missouri has been, of all people, uh, one of the folks pushing this, uh, to overhaul the way Congress counts electoral college votes, which of course was a gigantic question about a year or so ago uh, and, and led... Uh, and of course, that's what they were doing on January 6th in 2021. Uh, is this something you also think would be a, a step forward uh, to revise that, that uh, law that was originally enacted in 1887, <clears throat> long, long time ago? I think the most important thing right now is that we pass the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to ensure that every American, especially black and brown Americans, um, Americans with disabilities, anyone who may have any trouble getting to a ballot box has same day registration, um, has access to vote by mail. Uh, and that's important. We still haven't passed those key pieces of legislation that I think are so integral to preserving our democracy, upholding our constitution and voting rights are still under attack across this country. And that's where I think um, the priority of uh, Republicans and Democrats, all members of Congress needs to be. Do you think there's a uh, likelihood that there'll be some agreement on that? Because that, that seemed to have also been one of those bills like the Build Back Better Act that kind of ran into a stone wall there in the Senate. I think uh, who we send to Washington matters and this upcoming election will be extremely, extremely important. Um, you know, I'll share, I've worked in Congress before. I spent uh, a half decade, not only helping to elect Congressman Welch, but was there when we opened the door to the office and literally had to build a system from scratch to be responsive to Vermonters be it on social security benefits or veterans benefits. Um, I worked for the International Committee of the Red Cross. When my brother was deployed to Iraq, I went to work for the ICRC, which uh, supports full compliance by the U.S. government with the Geneva Conventions. And I've been thinking about that a lot right now with Ukraine. And, and my goodness, hopefully we're not going to see um, a war. But 
I think it's important with this election that we send uh, leaders to Washington who have experience, who know how Congress works and are ready to be deeply effective and, and uh, deliver real solutions to Vermont on day one. A candidate who is able to, to win statewide. I've, I've not only served statewide as lieutenant governor, but I've lived and worked across Vermont, including in southern Vermont, um, and will be a champion for southern Vermont as much as I will be for Orange County, where I grew up, and every corner of the state. But I think that experience really matters right now, and who we send to Washington matters, so we can continue that fight for voting rights, but really deliver for the American people, deliver for Vermonters, and stay laser, laser focused on the needs of the communities we have in the state. We have a lot of need. Well, we'll have to leave it there for today, Lieutenant Governor Gray. But again, I want to thank you for making the time for this conversation and uh, for giving us the opportunity to hear your views on some of these issues. Uh, it certainly is going to be an important election year. Well, I guess they're all important, but this one seems to be. <laughs> it certainly so. is. It certainly is an important moment for Vermont. And viewers listening, you can go to mollyforvermont.com. I'd love to uh, get you involved in the race. We need every Vermonter at the table participating, engaged, um, helping us really write the next chapter for our state and for this country. So thank you so much for the time. And I look forward to getting back to Southern Vermont soon. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll look forward to seeing you then. All right. Well, we'll leave it there for today. And uh, thank you again, Lieutenant Governor. And thank you all who have been uh, watching. I hope you found our program interesting. And uh, well, we'll see you again the next time. Anyway, have a great day.